Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, one long-range weather forecaster is predicting an early frost in the Midwest. We know it has been hot in the south, but other parts of the country also are being hit hard by the weather. In Southern Gardening, it may be hot this summer, but go for the lantana if you want a plant that can take the heat. In the markets, Pond Bank catfish prices continue to rise as solid export sales help out beef prices. In the feature segment, a farmer who's as much as home on Facebook and Twitter as he is on his dairy farm. Will Gilmer tweets every day to more than 2,500 followers about what's happening down on the farm. I don't think there's any dairy farms in downtown Manhattan or in Chicago or Los Angeles, so somebody has to let them know where their milk's coming from, and you know, it might as well be us. Hey everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artist Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. It's been a hot, dry summer in the Mid-South, and it's even drier in Texas and the Plains. Leighton, one weather forecaster says this will continue through the rest of the growing season, but the chances are good that there will be an early freeze in the Midwest. That's bad news for their growers, perhaps good news for prices. Meteorologist Jeff Doran Sr. of Planalytics says, this year's two-year La Nina does not bode well for a good finish to the corn crop in the Midwest. Doran told AgWeb.com that when a two-year La Nina occurs, there's usually an early freeze in parts of the corn belt. Doran said there have been 12 times where a two-year La Nina was recorded, and 10 of those years an early freeze took place, perhaps 7 to 10 days early in the Midwest. That's not good news for many Midwest corn farmers who needed a late fall to make up for a rain-delayed planting this spring. In the south and the west, Doran says there's not much moisture expected for the rest of the growing season. Only hurricanes might give some relief. It's not news anymore that it's hot in the south, but we're not the only area having weather problems. Some states have it worse than we do, much worse. Market to Market's Mark Pearson has this weather wrap-up. The nation's top cattle producing state of Texas is enduring a drought of epic proportions. Arid conditions continue to blanket much of the Lone Star State, where residents experienced the driest nine-month period and hottest June on record. More than 90% of the state is rated in the two most severe stages of drought. Pastures and water sources have withered under the hot sun, and now there are reports of livestock dying, not from a lack of water, but too much of it. Hoping to quench insatiable thirst, cattle have come over to hydrate, setting off what can become a fatal electrolyte balance. So far, an exact number of cattle deaths has not been tallied. Farther north, too much water is also a problem. Along the Missouri River, high water still covers hundreds of thousands of acres, but the end may be coming into focus. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers announced a reduction of outflow from five of six dams along the river. The Corps plans to reduce discharges from Gavin's Point, the final water regulation stretching from South Dakota to near St. Louis to 150,000 cubic feet per second by early August. But the threat of levee breaches still looms in Missouri as heavy snow melt and rainfall continues to make its way downstream. And the heart of the Corn Belt was slammed by unusually strong winds. Damage was confined to a narrow band that stretched from central Iowa all the way to Canada. The National Weather Service called the storm a derecho, a system of sustained winds associated with rapidly moving showers and thunderstorms. Winds from this particular storm range from 80 to 105 miles per hour, and the gusts push corn plants over in many locations. Early damage estimates ran into the hundreds of thousands of acres, but current estimates amount to only about 10% of that amount. When the summer heats up, is there a flowering plant that will stand up to the heat? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us the lantana is a plant that sizzles in the summer landscape. The 
summer temperatures are heating up and gardeners are looking for plants that'll stand up to the conditions. Today I'm at Mississippi State University's Truck Crops Branch Station looking at sizzling summer lantana. When you're looking for a tough summer plant that tolerates the hot summer temperatures, it's hard to beat lantana. Lantana is available in a variety of sizes and colors. Desert Sunset will grow to 42 inches tall. The flowers are a wonderful combination of yellow, gold, and peach. Lantana makes a good companion plant. Look at this combination of desert sunset with salvia blue spires. Another attractive variety is Lucky Sunrise Rose. It features pink and white flowers with yellow throats that contrast well with the dark green foliage. This plant has an upright and mounded growth habit and is well mannered through the season. There are new lantana varieties being evaluated by MSU researchers. The Luscious series features colorful selections of citrus blend, grape, tropical fruit, and lemonade. Luscious lemonade is really exciting because it has a spreading habit and will be a great selection for use as a ground cover. Lantanas also are excellent when used in the butterfly and hummingbird garden. The small funnel-shaped flowers hold the sugary nectar these garden entertainers look for. Lantana should be planted in the full sun for best flowering performance. During periods of low rainfall and high temperatures, lantana flower colors will make your landscape pop. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. They often toil out of the public eye, but that doesn't make their work any less important. I'm speaking of the Mississippi Association of Conservation Districts. The 24 counties of the South area met recently for their summer meeting in Hattiesburg. The goal is to help the districts keep up to date and share ideas with each other. And bring them up to date on activities and events that are going on and provide them some educational uh, ideas to take back to their districts. And uh, we just heard a presentation on getting involved in social media, Facebook. Uh, getting our word out uh, to people so they will know more about what soil and water conservation districts are doing. The MACD is made up of commissioners, deputy commissioners, and volunteers who help implement the programs of the Mississippi Soil and Water Conservation Commission and U.S. Department of Agriculture. The commissioners are elected from each county supervisor's district, but they are not paid. Our board of supervisors in every county across the state are our main funding source. Uh, we receive some funds through uh, cities as well, but most of the time our funds to run our districts are funded through the counties and the Board of Supervisors. So our job is to educate not only the farmer that's out there making a living, uh, growing crops or trees or whatever they're, they're producing on their farm, but also educating that urban uh, person that may be wanting to just have a vegetable garden in their backyard. A lot of our programs are educating the young people, uh, not only about conservation practices, but just about where food comes from in general. Where, where, where do they get their milk? And milk doesn't come from the, the dairy case at the grocery store. There's farmers out there that produce that. So we work very closely with our school teachers, our school districts. This year winner is Farm Week Television, Mississippi State Universal Extension Service, Artist Forward Editor. And we're pleased to announce that Farm Week was honored with the Southern District's Friend of Conservation Award for 2011. Farm Week was also given the same award from the Lamar County Soil and Water Conservation District. And here we are. Here they are. <laughs> Very handsome plaques, I might add, too. And we thank them for honoring us with that. Uh, it's always good to know that folks appreciate what you do. Helps you, helps you to go in and do it again the next day. But uh, it was kind of like old home time down there. A lot of people watched Farm Week a long time. It's time now, though, to get to the markets. And before we get to Layton, though, in our feature segment today, Will Gilmer of Sullivan, Alabama. He's a Mississippi State University graduate. He needs a tractor and a smartphone to run his dairy. He uses it to put agriculture before the public using social media such as Twitter and Facebook. As I said, time now for the markets with Leighton and Leighton. Soybean ending stocks reduced by the USDA. What about the market's reaction? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in our segment here coming up. Also this week, catfish processing is down. U.S. beef exports are reported to be solid while uncertainty remains about new crop corn. 
The monthly snapshot of how the farm-raised catfish industry is doing was released Wednesday afternoon, July 20th. The story continues to be fewer fish and higher prices. The average pond bank price being paid to U.S. producers in June was $1.23 per pound. That is 44 cents per pound higher than it was one year ago. Farm sales totaled over 24 million pounds round weight, a decrease of 37 percent from June 2010. Processor sales were almost 12 and one half million pounds. That is down 35 percent from a year ago. Analysts say feedlots are seeing more incoming cattle due to poor pasture conditions in especially the western areas of the country. The CME group is reporting that it wouldn't be a surprise to see placements top year-ago levels and to see feedlot inventories above year-ago levels as well. Reports indicate that even some spring calves are winding up in feedlots now. Analysts believe these developments could mean higher fed cattle numbers through the end of this year. Well, most traders are of the opinion that solid beef exports have helped to shore up boxed beef prices this season. Analyst Alan Brugler tells Market to Market that although product demand domestically could soften, the price moves of late have been favorable. And that's a combination of, of uh, supply and also demand, and the consumption at least. Export market is really the key there. We, we continue to make export sales of 13,000, 14,000, 15,000 tons a month. That's meat that the, we don't have to move into the U.S. market. Right. Uh, U.S. market got a little nervous here because of the unemployment data floating around here. But, but again, the, the export market has been so solid that it's allowed us to keep those box beef prices up. The packer's been able to pay up for the cattle. And, of course, the futures are going to reflect that. We have our trivia quiz next on Farm Week. When did the United States have the fewest number of cotton gins? Was it 1991, 2002, 2009, or 2010? You'll find out the right answer here in a few more minutes. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar of the second part of the markets. Leighton Spann talks with Mississippi State University's John Michael Riley about the summer market in corn and soybeans. In the feature segment today, he's an MSU graduate who operates a northwest Alabama dairy farm. Bill Gilmer also has a Twitter account with 2,500 followers who keep up with his daily chores. Committed? Without a doubt. Because true beauty takes time. It's a process, but when you're committed, you do the work. And in the end, when you've put in the time, the real masterpiece is revealed. So yes, I'm committed to my marriage. Till death do us part. Commit to your marriage. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University will hold a whitetail deer management short course next Saturday, July 30th. The cost is $95. That includes lunch, a t-shirt, and educational materials. You'll learn about the factors that influence antler size and how different harvest methods affect it. Methods differ for spikes and bucks. The location is the College of Forest Resources building on the main campus of Mississippi State University in Starkville. Registration is limited to the first 70 people, so we'll have a link on the Farm Week calendar to help you register ahead of time. Mississippi State University's McNeil Unit will hold its annual Muscadine Field Day on Saturday, August 13th. The McNeil Unit is located on Highway 11, just south of McNeil. The hours are 8.30 to 11.30 in the morning. There's no registration fee. Almost all the Muscadine varieties available to the public are grown at this unit. So go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this Farm Week snapshot. The summer market for corn and soybeans is the focus of this week's market interview. Besides monitoring price trends, Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley has been looking over the recent July crop and supply demand numbers for these commodities. I talked to him Wednesday afternoon, July 20th. John Michael, let's begin with corn, and I understand ending stocks for both old and new crop were increased. That's correct. It, uh, the increase largely reflected the higher acreage number that was reported in the, the June acreage report from USDA. And 
uh, that, that, that bumped the total production in the U.S. It bumped, you know, it kind of fed through and, and increased ending stocks. However, that number was, was lower than, than the pre-report estimate. Uh, the pre-report was looking for uh, right at a billion bushels of ending stocks, and, and USDA reported 870 million last week. So a bit of a shock there. It did, it did you know, provide some positive uh, information for the market. But again, yeah, they were bumped versus the previous month's uh, Ag Supply and Demand report uh, because of that higher acreage number. But I would imagine there's still uh, considerable doubt about what final production will look like time we get to harvest this fall. S still a tremendous amount of uncertainties. The, the crop is still behind schedule. Uh, the crop looks good according to, uh, to condition reports, but behind schedule. And uh, for the most part, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of hot weather out there that, that could be pushing yields down. All right, let's talk about soybeans a little bit. What did the report have to say as far as soybeans? Again, uh, uh, actually reduced the ending stocks number for the, the current, mar current growing season crop, uh, right at 190 million bushels ending stocks. Uh, not a whole lot of changes there in the, in the acreage number from, from June, but uh, again, not a whole lot of surprises there for soybeans as well. But again, it, the, the market kind of has reacted as, it, as corn has for the most part. They've kind of followed one another. No big, no big real surprises, though, in regard to soybeans. Are we likely to, to be on the edge of our seats a little bit with soybeans as we, as we get uh, towards harvest in a few more months? We, we will. As, as, with all, as with all the crops, you know, soybeans are behind schedule just like corn across most of the Midwest and even in, here in Mississippi. So there is a lot of uncertainty in, as to what these final yields are going to be. I think we have a, a, a better, better handle on that soybean acreage versus corn, but there is a lot of uncertainty about what those final yields are going to be. And I guess, uh, again, the next report uh, in August, uh, we may see some changes that are unexpected. They're going to resurvey in a couple of states uh, due to some flooding uh, for, for acreage numbers, and, and that's going to be reflected in the August report. We're also going to start getting some objective yield data back, which uh, will we'll move from trend line, and it will actually be data coming in from the field. So uh, that August report is one that we're really going to look heavily to. That August report will be released on Thursday morning the 11th, just in time for Farm Week production. Well, let's give you the trivia answer now. The all-time low for the number of U.S. cotton gins came two years ago in 2009. The number dipped to 680. On a more positive note, CottonFarming.com reports gin numbers are rebounding now. Earlier this year, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack said that producers need to work to get the message out that farming is important. Well, a dairy farmer near the Mississippi-Alabama state line has been doing just that long before the president administration even came into office. Will Gilmer is using all forms of social media to bridge the gap between agriculture and the rest of the world. Some might just call Gilmer an early adopter, but the Mississippi State graduate sees his communication work as part of the responsibility he has as a farmer. I don't think there's any dairy farms in downtown Manhattan or in Chicago or Los Angeles, so somebody has to let them know where their milk's coming from, and you know, it might as well be us. When it comes to using social media to tell agriculture's story, few people do it any better than Mississippi State alumnus and third-generation dairy farmer Will Gilmer. Using his smartphone, Gilmer may post over a half dozen messages a day on Twitter. All the cows have been milked and fed for the morning, he wrote on July 6th. After breakfast, we're going to sort and vaccinate young heifers. Since the messages originate from his smartphone, Gilmer may send them from the floor of the milking parlor, or from the cab of his tractor, or from anywhere else on the farm located near Sullivan, Alabama, across the state line from Aberdeen, Mississippi. The messages give followers a snapshot of farming on an everyday basis. What seems to work best, uh, or what i found has worked best for me to do to, to keep people's interest and attract people to Listen, what I'm saying is just talk about what we're actually doing on the farm, kind of day in and day out, and just give them kind of an idea of what, what farming life is and, and, and what we do. Many times, Gilmer will take a picture like this with his smartphone and post it on Twitter. After two months with no calves, we're starting to have a few dry cows freshen, he tweeted with the photo. This cow gave birth to a bull today. Will Gilmer has over 2,700 people following him on Twitter, but this popular social media is only one of many ways Gilmer communicates about agriculture from the farm. Of course, he has a Facebook page up and running for the dairy, too. Over 1,800 people have clicked that they like something on the page. But long before Twitter and Facebook, Will Gilmer's very first communication effort was the Dairy Farm website. 
He developed and launched it almost 10 years ago, in 2003. Today, it includes an educational tool for children that Will Gilmer calls adopt cow Once you sign up online, an 8x10 photo of the cow you choose is emailed to you, along with a certificate of adoption. A child can then check the website monthly for updates on how the cow's milk production is going and whether it's had a calf. The website also features a photo of the current Milk Mustache Contest winner. That annual contest is always a feature of June Dairy Month. After the website was fine-tuned, Will Gilmer added another social media tool in 2007, the Dairyman's Blog. It was more or less just a way to have a news feature for our farm. We had a page on our website where I would update about once a month what had been happening, but it wasn't updated enough that people particularly cared to read it, so I thought, well, if I do a blog and do it more often, maybe we'll be able to reach more people, and it, uh, that worked, and everything else has just kind of spread from there. The Sunday, June 19th post on the blog was devoted to Father's Day. Will simply titled it, My Dad, a Farmer and a Family Man. Will has been farming with his father, David Gilmer, since graduating from college in 2001. In the summer of 2011, they had 163 cows in the milking herd, the lowest number in quite a while. The 600-acre farm has a total inventory of over 450 Holstein cows, heifers, and calves. Will's father, David Gilmer, is a second-generation dairyman and also a Mississippi State graduate. David doesn't actively use social media himself, but totally supports his son Will's efforts to communicate about agriculture. Somebody needs to tell our story because there's plenty of people out there ready to tell a story, but it may not be just exactly how it is. Will Gilmer added videos to his website in 2009 and began posting them on YouTube as well. His father has appeared with him in at least one segment of the MooTube Minute, as the videos are called. This episode is titled A Typical Day on Gilmer Dairy Farm and has received almost 1,400 views online. Other segments focus on vocabulary. This episode explained the term slurry to viewers. Other editions of the MooTube Minute simply deal with particular events on the farm. Hi, this is Will Gilmer with the Gilmer Dairy Farm MooTube Minute. Coming to you from our maternity pasture where Big Annie, number 232, has just given birth to a heifer calf about 10 minutes ago. I've always tried to be informative during them, but the first ones I really tried to be kind of wacky and a little bit out there because you have to do something different to get people to pay attention to you. And by doing that, I was able to start building a, you know, a group of people who, who would subscribe to the videos and watch them. And as, as that has grown, I've been able to get a little bit more serious and talk about the, you know, going more in depth about the things we're actually doing. And that's not to say I still don't do a few goofy ones now and then or sing or something like that. And I'm proud for Will to be able to kind of use these avenues to get our message out that, uh, that hey, we're doing things as uh, efficiently as we can. We're trying to take care of the environment. We're taking care of our animals and uh, are just being good stewards of uh, what we've been given control over. Will Gilmer was chairman of the American Farm Bureau Federation Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee during 2010. He used that position to encourage other producers to follow his lead in getting the message out about agriculture using social media. He has no doubt that other young farmers around the country are more involved in communication now and that consumers are picking up on the messages and responding. We, we do get a lot of uh, feedback from people that are in agriculture that ask us about some of the some of the things we're doing on the farm. But we're also getting comments from people who live in cities and urban centers who don't have a dairy farm anywhere around them or any kind of agriculture really. So, so it's a great way for us to connect with those people. You know, the way I look at it, you know, me and my dad, you know, and other farmers in this area have a responsibility to talk to people in our area, in our community, about the things we're doing. But there's, you know, places in this country where there are not farmers available and they need to hear about agriculture too. So we also have that responsibility to talk to them. From out in the country, social media is enabling dairy farmer Will Gilmer to successfully convey his important message around the nation. From Sullivan, Alabama, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. 
You can watch this story again on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have links to the Gilmer Dairy Farm website and Facebook page. There's also Gilmer's YouTube channel, Twitter account, and the Dairyman's blog. And again, it's all at farmweek.msucares.com. And he's found out what we found out. You got to put yourself everywhere, and it does take time, but uh, I'm glad. But he takes the time, and he's got all the tools flowing. Well, and he's willing to do it, and motivation always means a lot in anything that you do. Good story. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our show next week, many of you can't recall the time when milk used to be delivered to your door. And just when you thought that getting locally bottled milk couldn't happen, you'll meet two Mississippi dairy families that are trying it. One Oxford area family concentrates on liquid milk, while the other South Mississippi operation does other milk products as well. In Southern Gardening, see how a small vegetable garden can produce big results. You don't have to have a couple of acres. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week.